OneFuse integrations. So we're going to start by talking about the breadth of integration with OneFuse. We're going to look at the available integrations today. So this is the OneFuse platform. This is the landing page for our pre-production release of 1.3. It should be available within the next two weeks. But we currently have available Ansible Tower as an integration, DNS, IPAM, Microsoft Active Directory, naming, custom naming. We'll, we'll dig into that first here in just a minute. Agentless scripting and this agentless scripting module allows you to specify scripts that you want to serve up that can be consumed either in guests during the provisioning process or from a predefined node like a PowerShell host. Uh, and this would be agentless in fashion. They're all executed by a SSH. We then have as part of our 1.3 release, we've introduced support for ServiceNow. So this would be ServiceNow CMDB and this is executing CI records as policy. Um, in addition, the ServiceNow connector portion, this would be the portion of the module that would allow you to consume any of our OneFuse modules directly from the ServiceNow catalog. It could be naming as a service, could be IPAM as a service, DNS as a service, or some of our downstream platforms. We now offer vRealize Automation as a service so you can consume VRA blueprints directly from the OneFuse platform, allowing us to serve them up in ServiceNow Connector to be able to submit those requests directly from ServiceNow. Also, as part of the 1.3 release, we've introduced SolarWinds as an IPAM provider. Um, there's a number of backend functionality that's been added as well, including uh, custom filters for Jinja 2, so that you can now construct your own Jinja 2 custom filters as well. The bulk of what we're going to talk about here today is depth of integration. What are the requirements that we meet inside of OneFuse policies? So we're going to start by talking about codeless policy-driven integrations that provide dynamic outcomes and kind of unpack what we mean by a policy-driven integration. What does it mean to have a policy-driven integration? So codeless in the fact that we talked about this already where these OneFuse modules are consumed from your upstream platforms, could be your cloud management platform, your infrastructure as code tool, or your service catalog where you specify a property or derive the automation that you're looking for in Terraform, things along those lines. You don't have to write custom code to consume these unless you're leveraging a platform that we don't currently support. But it then reaches out to these different policies. So this is for our naming module. These are the policies that we have available. And with naming, you can see here that we name not just traditional servers or machines. We can have a naming policy for machines, or maybe we have a, a, a naming policy for production machines or development machines. But we can standardize names for anything inside of your environment that can gain value from having a standardized name that meets a, a predefined format. For instance, F5 virtual IPs. Uh, maybe S3 buckets, we want to standardize names for those, or other things inside of your environment, physical devices like routers and switches. These are things that in environments that I've worked in in the past, names for routers and switches are typically stored in somebody's spreadsheet on their desktop. Not a very enterprise-grade solution, but um, with OneFuse, we can help to standardize all of these different things for your environment, and we're going to start by looking at this machine naming policy. So this is a policy and the, the policy is going to execute. And in this instance, it's going to create a name that follows the things, we, things we've defined inside of this policy. There's a lot of things going on in here, but we're gonna start by looking at this naming template. On the left-hand side, we'll see here that there are curly brackets. This means that this is a templatable field. We are leveraging Jinja 2 template engine syntax, which is one of the more popular template engines out there in any of these fields with the curly brackets. And what that means is we're going to be able to specify what we're going to do with our name. So in this instance, we're asking the end user to input a group, a location, an environment, an OS, and an application. And we're going to leverage that information to derive the naming standard for, or, or the name that we're going to pass back as a result of this policy. We can select the visibility icon here and we show you a preview of what that name's going to look like. And that's based off of a templated value that we have selected over here, something we call static property sets. So this templated value, you can see we have name ENV and those other name parameters are included in here. This is a template that I have built out beforehand that is representative 
of what a workload inside of my environment would look like. If, for instance, I wanted to switch this over to a different template, we can see in real time that name updates to reflect the updated property stack that we're passing in to filter it through the template. So in real time, we're capable of rendering and giving you, showing you what this template is going to generate. And uh, it's not gonna fail there, but we also have this required parameter in here. So if these properties aren't passed in, it will actually fail to build process. So maybe we didn't wanna make name group required. So we can just get rid of that portion of the, the template. And now name group is an optional parameter. And that happens every time this policy gets executed, giving you granular, the ability to granular, granularly define how we want our names to be generated or other objects. This is not specific to naming, it's just a starting example. So this pipe required, again, gives you control over the required parameters. We have a lot of different filters that are available. We can see here that we're actually making a logical statement inside of this syntax where if the user is passing in a DNS suffix, I want to return that DNS suffix and that's what we're gonna use as our DNS suffix value. If not, I'm gonna use this soblabs.net, which is a default value that uh, allows us in policy to define a default value for DNS suffix. So policy-driven integrations, anything defined inside of that policy is going to allow us to control the outcomes of how we're going to create these integrations and, and provision the things that are requested. Validation. So, and this is just an example, as part of our naming module, we have these validators that are configured. Um, where it is possible, we validate our integrations to verify that we are not going to cause collisions inside of your environment. For naming, that means that you can define per policy. So this is anytime we execute this machine policy, we're going to validate the name that is generated against our production DNS. We're gonna validate it against our VRA7 production environment, maybe VRA development production. It's going to filter through all of these environments. And if it doesn't find a conflicting name, it's gonna hand the name back. We know that any name that's passed back from this policy has been validated against all of these endpoints. If it does find a name in maybe our DNS, what it will do is then very simply increment to the next available number inside of this machine sequence that I've defined as part of my template. So it gives you a way to prevent provisioning failures, but also allows you to prevent collisions inside of your environment as well. So uh, validation. We also offer validation across a lot of these other modules. This is just kind of big, big picture idea of, of what's going on. Auditability and visibility. So depth of integration, when we talk about auditability and visibility, when we come back to maybe our naming module, again, we can scroll down to the bottom. We can see that we have these managed names inside of this environment. Uh, these are all resources. Any names that are currently active inside of the environment, resources that haven't been destroyed yet, are visible inside of the platform. So you can allow your security teams access to this platform or whoever needs be to be able to view and troubleshoot and see what has been produced inside of your environment. We can see here the different sources that have submitted requests, whether they're coming from Terraform or CloudBolt or vRealize Automation, the different endpoints we support. You can view where the requests are coming from. You can see who made the request. You can see what name was generated and what policy they were generated from. We can dive in further by selecting this visibility icon, which takes us to the job that was leveraged to create this name. Um, if you did want to figure out, and maybe you want to write some automation on your own, we give you the API call that was leveraged to create this name. We want to make this simple and consumable for our customers. We then give you the entire payload that was passed in. This is invaluable for troubleshooting policy execution where we can see maybe it failed because domain wasn't passed in. We can see here that domain is passed in, but we can see what the domain value was and why a policy would have executed the way it did to generate this result. And we can scroll down here. We can see that this name was generated from this policy. We can also see the different logs that are available in here. This is very valuable. If you have a policy execution fail, you can very quickly come in and look at maybe why that policy execution failed. We give you some pretty useful logs as far as what's happening in here. Um, naming's fairly straightforward, but some of the other systems will tell you if 
there's communication issues or authentication failures with the different integration endpoints that we talk to. Deprovisioning. So by default, we include as part of that codeless automation, anytime you create a name or an IP address or a DNS record or an Active Directory computer object, whenever we've created something during the build process and you go and deprovision that thing in your CMP or do a Terraform destroy, when you get rid of it, we've defined how to reclaim those things. So it will actually reach out to the platform and get rid of the IP address that was created during provisioning. Um, as a result, this will reach out to the Infobox platform in this particular instance and reclaim that IP address so that we're destroying all of the artifacts that we created during provisioning. So deprovisioning is very important to us. Some of our modules, for instance, agentless scripting, allow us to actually define maybe a deprovisioning script. So in this one, I'm going to create an Active Directory user. We see the provisioning script defined here. But when we destroy that managed object, I'm also allowing the customer to go back through. And when they get rid of the managed object, we're going to define how to deprovision that via script. So it's going to reach out, get that Active Directory user that was created, and then remove them from Active Directory so that we're cleaning up that, that user. Um, in addition, Ansible Tower also offers a, a similar capability. When we execute job templates in Ansible Tower, we can see we have provisioning job templates here at the top, and we have the capability to define deprovisioning job templates down here at the bottom. So cleaning up the things that we do during integration, and that's something that working with a lot of customers, when, when they write their own custom integrations, a lot of times this deprovisioning aspect is something that's overlooked until it's too late, and then they have to go through and manually clean up a lot of uh, additional metadata in their environment that isn't necessarily required. So OneFuse also provides this layer of abstraction. We talked about this a little bit from an upstream provider standpoint before, but from a downstream perspective, again, the power of the policy, we have, for instance, for our IPAM module, we have this ATL prod IPAM policy. And as part of this IPAM policy, it's backed by an Infoblox endpoint today. If, for instance, your company needed to switch IPAM providers from an Infoblox to a BlueCat or from Infoblox to SolarWinds or vice versa, you would go out and have to do the backend data migration so that your IP addresses migrate to the new system. But as far as your cloud management platform is concerned, you can continue to point to this ATL prod policy and we can change the backing provider here so that you're now both claiming new IP addresses from maybe BlueCat, and you're also deprovisioning your old IP addresses from BlueCat as well, because provision and deprovision all executes via the policy. So we just changed the backing provider, um, and it's all defined inside of the policy. Once you've switched your, your policies over, now your automation solutions claim those from the appropriate source. And then from an upstream provider perspective, again, cross-platform standardization, um, whether it's one team working with multiple tools or multiple teams working with multiple tools, you can standardize how you're doing integrations for the entire organization, leveraging the OneFuse integration platform. And then very lastly, the policy features span requirements across hundreds of customers. The, the OneFuse platform and the product that preceded it has worked with hundreds of customers over the last seven, eight, nine years to very clearly understand how they're leveraging cloud management tools and what provisioning requirements might be for different organizations. We've taken the most popular requirements, we've bundled all of them into the OneFuse platform so that we can give you the integration depth that is required by the customers that we've worked with. So just to summarize, OneFuse integrations handle both the breadth of integration, that, that width, the, the different endpoints we need to talk to, but also the depth of integration. How deep are your specific requirements um, in helping to mitigate the amount of custom code required to get these solutions to work inside of your environment according to your requirements?